I never actually paid for the Gemini Pro or Plus plan because their free tier is ridiculously generous. Most people, when they use Gemini, they default to the web UI, the application. But many of them don't realize that there is an AI studio that Google provides, which also has many of the paid features that come with Gemini Pro and Plus, but for free. It's basically their API playground, similar to what Anthropic and ChatGPT have. But for me, it takes on different tasks that saves me hours of time. Let me show you three common ways that I use this tool that you've probably not tried yet. Alrighty. So we're going to run through a variety of things. First, we'll start with both why is it free and why do I default to Gemini 2.5 Pro specifically for long context tasks. Then we'll talk about what is it, specifically the UI, how to get to it, and some of the features around the UI. And then lastly, we'll end on the three use cases that I mentioned that I use this commonly for that you might get some use from as well. First is why. So why is this so cheap? Well, there's probably a lot of reasons as to why it's cheap. Here are two theories that I have, which may or may not be accurate, but let's go with it. So Google has mainly uh, GPUs, or sorry, TPUs that it uses for both its training and inference. And that gives it an upper hand in the amount of money it costs them to operate these models and distribute it out to you. So they can then utilize these TPUs instead of GPUs, which they created, to save them money and also offer things like this for free. Also, I'm sure, as you know, Google has a crap ton of money. And that means that in the short term, they can seek market share instead of profits. So they can burn a bunch of money trying to get more users in, in that process, offer a lot of free things in their free tier, and then hopefully take more market share over time. So that's my thesis as to why it's so cheap. Now the question is, why do I default to this model for long context? Well, oftentimes, when you look at different types of benchmarks for evaluating the quality of a model, there's different options that people use when they talk about context windows, one of which is needle in the haystack. So this specific benchmark has become somewhat saturated and most different most model providers really don't talk about it much because it is so saturated. So what is it? Well, it's basically fact finding. So here is a um, somewhat recent, so this is three opus, so this is kind of outdated, but still this is getting the point across. So this is an older image of an older model doing needle in the haystack. And what they're trying to do is find a random fact inside of a massive data set. So imagine that we have, uh, say, War and Peace, the book. And inside of that, I've put in I Love Unicorns inside of there somewhere. And it has to find that fact somewhere, or at least it has to find a fact that stands out or is different than what everything else is inside of the book. Most models can find that very easily. And meaning when it's saturated, so if it's not saturated, it has a bunch of red dots like this down here and this chart on the right-hand side. But on the left-hand side, all models look like this now, where basically the entire box is all green, meaning that it finds all of the facts and all the different context windows um, irrelevant to the size. But the reason this isn't useful is random fact finding in data sets isn't a practical use case that's going to help me in my day-to-day -day, um, day -day reasons for using these tools. And that's why there's new benchmarks like fiction.live that helps us utilize these models or at least measure the quality of these models and use cases that actually matter to us. So instead of finding a random fact, these models have to be tested against their ability to find facts across space. What do I mean by across space? Well, when you look at a model and you ask it a question such as, here's a book. In this book, I'm gonna ask you a very specific question. To answer this question effectively, you have to be able to take a fact from chapter one, a, a historical reference in chapter three, maybe a character reference in chapter six, and then some sort of climactic event in chapter eight. You have to string all of those facts together to then answer my question cohesively. If you can do that effectively in a variety of context windows, that shows just how um, high quality the model is and its ability to answer questions across space in the data set, irrelevant of the size. And you can see this exactly what they're testing out here in this benchmark. So here we have different models that a lot of people are aware of. So here we have O3, um, O3 Pro, so O3 Pro 3, we have Claude Opus 4, Claude Opus or Sonnet 4, uh, we have Gemini 2.5 Pro and Grok 4. Now the thing we want to look at here is the scores. So O3 Pro is quite good up to a point. So once it gets to 192k tokens, the, the performance degrades down to 65%. You can see it's 100 all the way up to here, 97, 194, and 88. These are all really good scores. But once it gets too far off and the window gets too big, it degrades. Same thing applies to Opus and uh, Thinking. So they're good all the way up until around... Uh, interestingly, actually, Sonnet's better than Opus on this, which is surprising. So all the way up until 120K, it gets 81, which is still good. But it hasn't been tested on this, which is kind of lame. 
And then down here, you can see Gemini 2.5 Pro by far is, is still the best, really, when it actually goes to the 192K. And hopefully, they'll keep testing this even further. So they'll get to 200,000 to 200, tokens, 500,000, a million, et cetera. And you can see the quality of these models' ability to answer questions effectively across space. And then Grok 4 is really high quality as well. You can see the one that was recently released all the way up to 84 for 192K. So these are the types of benchmarks that you'll want to look at when you assess the quality of a model's ability to utilize long context windows. And that's why when I use these use cases that I'll walk you through in a second, that's why I default to this model. And also it's free, which is a bonus. Quick pause in your programming. If you're enjoying this, you're likely going to enjoy the 30-day AI Insight series that I have. Below is a link where it's completely free. You get a free 30 days of AI Insights that you can utilize for your business, for your day-to-day -day work, etc. So if you're interested, check it out. Let's get back to the video. So what is it? Well, oftentimes, when you think about Gemini, most people go to this screen here. So this is the basic Gemini application where you utilize their features. So here you have gems, canvas, et cetera, all the things that are useful for Gemini. But you're capped on the free tier pretty strictly on the, on the app itself. I always hit the cap often when using the app. So that's why I default to their AI Studio, which is what this is. So this is kind of what AI Studio looks like. And I'll actually, what I'll do is I'll show you um, AI Studio on my screen. So this here, is AI Studio. And there's a few things I'm gonna walk you through. So first we'll look at the right-hand side. So on the right-hand side here, this is where you choose your models. So you can do 2.5 Pro, Flash, etc. You can have, you have a bunch of settings here that you can play around with, which you can play around with if you're interesting, but most of the time it's relevant. And then you also have a grounding feature down here, which is pretty important. And my face is kind of in the way, but if I scroll down, you'll probably be able to see it. Let me do that. Uh, maybe not. Yeah, here we go. So here you can see this grounding feature, which is ability to search the internet if it needs to. And then also you have the ability to upload files. You can even create system prompts. So here are system instructions. You can add system instructions. Uh, you can do a variety of other things. So this is their AI Studio, which mimics their Gemini app pretty effectively. It doesn't have all the features that it has, but it has enough for you to do a lot with it. And like I said, the free tier for this AI Studio is extremely high. So you'll see if I hover over this model here for 2.5 Pro, at the very bottom, there's rate limits in the bottom center, and it says 150 RPM. What that means is you get 150 requests per minute, and then the daily cap, I think, is like 500 or 1,000. And I never hit that, and I'm sure you, you likely won't if you're using it through the UI. If you're trying to use the API, it's a different story. But right now, we're just talking about using the UI for the AI Studio. And then for Flash, if I go here, you can see that it has 1,000 RPM, which is 1,000 requests per minute. And then it has 500 requests per day as, as the max, which is likely the similar to Pro, but they just don't show it here. So that's the general rundown of the UI. You can see other things here, but that's that's all we really need for um, the use cases we're going to walk through. Okie dokie. So now let's get to the use cases. The first use case is processing large documents. So there's three primary use cases I use this for. And the first one here is API documentation. So if there are certain API docs that I would like to ask questions about before I start developing or coding something, I'll often drop it into Gemini if it's exceeding 200,000 tokens, or maybe even 120. So one thing you can do with um, AI Studio is you can drop any size document inside of it, even if it's above a million tokens, and it'll at least tell you the token count. So I've dropped files in there that are like three to five million tokens, and it's obviously too big for Gemini to handle, but it's good for me to understand the token uh, threshold of the file I'm dropping in so I know what to cut out so I can then fit into other models. So when I drop anything into Gemini and AI Studio, I can see the token count. So if it's below 120K, I often go to Sonnet 4 or Opus 4 or O3 from OpenAI to do the assessment or ask questions about the API docs. But if it's above 120K or maybe even 200K, I'll often just stay in AI Studio and ask the questions inside of there. So that's the API docs. Another one is looking at code. So if I'm developing on an existing code base, I'll drop the code inside of AI Studio and ask questions of the code base to understand different areas of the code base and um, assess where a feature should be built out. So AI Studio is good for this, but honestly, over time, Cursor and Claude have gotten very good at condensing down large code bases and finding different areas um, inside of that code base. And when I mention Claude, I mean Claude code specifically. So this has historically been my go-to for assessing code inside of Gemini or AI Studio. I'd recommend maybe considering Claude Code instead because it's uh, actually really good with large code bases and finding exact areas and features you need to make updates to. And then last, it's just understanding different documents that I want to understand and ask questions about. So this is a, a beautiful icon of the big, beautiful bill that just recently came out in the US, BBB. And I wanted to ask some questions around this and how it was relevant for me and my company, et cetera. 
So the original bill that was published, I think, like a month ago, it was around 224,000 tokens. So it exceeded any of the other models' ability to assess. So I had to ask AI Studio the questions associated to, a, to my business, et cetera, so I can understand more about this document. So that's another really good place to drop big files to understand the context of the file and what you care about. Our next use case is bugs. So this is a common flow that I go through when I run into gnarly bugs. And this flow is somewhat changing as the models get better and also the tools associated to the models get better. But I still use this from time to time when I run into a gnarly bug that I can't fix inside of Cursor or Claude. So we're assuming when this process starts that Cursor and Claude could not solve the problem we tried multiple times. So what we're gonna do in this case is I'm gonna be either in Cursor or, or actually now Claude code more often. And I'll ask, what, I'll ask this specific model inside of this tool to summarize the different errors that we're running into, our attempted fixes, and ensure that the explanation it provides me is unbiased and also give it context and constraints that we're gonna pass this explanation off to another AI engineer to pick up where they've dropped off. So once I've gotten this explanation, I'm then going to package up the entire code base into a file that I can then pass off to AI Studio. So it's either gonna be an XML or TXT. Now, oftentimes people might ask, well, why don't you just have Gemini 2.5 Pro inside of one of these tools to assess the code base? Well, if you don't necessarily have the max plan or the, the willingness to use max inside of Cursor, you're automatically capped right now at 128K tokens for any of the models. In Cloud Code, it does a good job, like I said, so this is becoming less of a case, but sometimes it still is. And it doesn't necessarily have the ability to use the 1 million tokens, obviously, because it doesn't have Gemini inside of it. So Cursor is really our only go-to here if we want to use Gemini inside of the tool. And then another reason actually why we may want to pull it out of these tools and go straight to the model is that tools like Cursor, there tends to be a lot of um, bloated context inside of this that we're unaware of. So think about it as different layers of a cake. So here we have the base layer of the cake where the model sits. Above this, we have the tool we're using in Cursor. And then above this is our prompt and our context that we provide. Well, the issue here is oftentimes the context that's being filled by the tool provider, such as Cursor, is often useful, but sometimes it can be a hindrance and not be useful at all. In that case, we wanna remove this abstraction and go directly to the model so there is no bloated context that we're unaware of, so we can have a better chance of the model fixing our problem without us running into issues. And different ways we can compact this data set, the entire code base, are tools uh, such as Yeek. So this is just, it's, this is Rust's logo, but the tool is called Yeek, Yeek. And this one is called Repo Mix. Uh, you can use these for different reasons. I often use Yeek for larger code bases because it's in Rust and it's a lot faster when it comes to compressing the code base. And then Repo Mix is still a good option if you want to use that. It's just a way to condense your entire code base into an XM file or a TXC file that you can then upload into AI Studio so you can see the entire code base. Once you've done this, you're going to pass both the explanation and the code base to it. And what I'll do is I'll ask Gemini to first identify the root cause. Once it's ID'd the root cause, then I'll ask it to provide a fix. And once it's provided the fix, I'll then have it restructure this fix into a series of prompts. So it's found the fix, it's provided the fix, and I say, okay, rewrite this fix in a way that I can pass it off to an AI engineer. Specifically, what I want you to do is I want you to give me a series of prompts that are independent from each other, where I can pass each prompt into the AI to then implement this fix incrementally. So make sure that the prompts aren't too big to overwhelm it and aren't too small to ensure that we're at least making uh, significant progress on each prompt. And that's kind of what this looks like. So we have all of the prompts that AI Studios Gemini given us. So each prompt, one, two, three, et cetera. And then we're going to pass these incrementally into, for instance, Claude code and have Claude code apply the fix over time as we pass each prompt into it. And by the end, oftentimes, we fix the bug that we've ran into in the past. So this is a great way to solve gnarly bugs you're running into. Our last use case is transcription. So there's two common ways I use transcription right now with AI Studio for free is converting shorts into LinkedIn posts. So sometimes I'll record shorts for LinkedIn and that short video that I record, I also wanna have some sort of complimentary text with it. So I'll upload the audio or I'll actually upload the entire video into AI Studio. When I've uploaded it, it'll transcribe it. Once it's transcribed it, I'll actually pass this off to Claude or GPT, depending on you know what I'm doing. And it'll then rewrite or write that LinkedIn post based off of the transcript I've given it. So I can then have both the video and the write-up inside of LinkedIn when I post this, this uh, piece of content. 
So this next one is actually an interesting use case provided me to a friend of mine named Anthony, where you do a form of taste testing for podcasts that you want to listen to. So I'm not sure about you, but I have a massive queue in my YouTube of a bunch of podcasts that I want to listen to, but I haven't gotten to yet. So this is my depiction of what that looks like. So we have all these different podcasts that we don't have time to listen to. But maybe you want to get a taste test of each one of these to figure out which ones you actually want to listen to and spend time with. So what you can do is depending on the size. So if the video is usually around one hour for the podcast, it will fit inside of the context window for AI Studio to transcribe. If it exceeds this, then you may want to convert this um, using, I think it's like YT DLP, which is a library you can use and have AI basically write a script that pulls this out for you. And you can get the entire file and transcript from that way. But if you don't want to do that, you don't have access to it, and it fits this constraint of less than one hour, you can just pass it off into AI Studio. It'll transcribe it for you. Once it's transcribed this, then you can ask it to pull out any novel insights from this podcast that you, that you can share with me. So it'll pull out maybe five or 10 novel insights, and you can skim these summaries. So after you've, after you've skimmed all the summaries from each one of these podcasts, you can say, okay, from this, I'm more likely interested in this one, and we can ignore all of these and remove them from our queue. So we have one primary podcast to focus on based off of how unique the insights are relating to what we're interested in. So this is just another use case I use AI Studio for. And as I said, these are all free because the free tier is extremely generous, at least right now. So we have transcription, we have bugs, and we have large documents. If you enjoyed this, please reshare it with your friends. And as I said earlier, below is a link to a free 30-day AI insight series. So you can get insights just like this for 30 days straight on how you can apply AI to your business and also your day-to-day -day work. If that's interesting to you, check out the link below. With that being said, internet, I'll see you next time.